Susan, when we deal in our own lives with relatives of parents who uh, age and 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 experience the the mental decline of aging, which everybody mm -hmm. goes through, uh, it's a personal tragedy. I mean, I feel it. Uh, ma mm -hmm. Many people do when we deal with it. Uh, there, there are two ways we can use that to uh, to make progress uh, mm -hmm. for human beings to make mm -hmm. progress. One is, can we can we help people mm -hmm. in that situation? The other is, what can we learn about the 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 normal brain from situations when brains go bad? So I think the first thing really to establish, Robert, is that Alzheimer's disease is just that. It's a disease. Um, it's a disease of older people, but it's not. It is not a natural consequence of aging. And my own view is that if it's a disease, it must have a cause or causes. And if we could identify them, then we could make some advances into stopping stopping the problem. And at the moment, there hasn't been a successful treatment or a new drug even for Alzheimer's for the last 15 years. Now, why is this? I think really what we need to know is why is it, why is it, and this comes to the second part of your question, why is it that certain brain cells embark on this cycle, this remorseless cycle of self-destruction that we call neurodegeneration? Why is this? Because we know that if you have a stroke, you can get partial recovery, sometimes, thankfully, complete mm. recovery of function. Mm. So it's not a generic feature of brain cells that if one or two of them are damaged, that you automatically set in train what we call neurodegeneration. So what we need to know is the basic mechanism. Why is it that certain cells are dying? Now, if we knew that, if, then I think we could have a most marvelous approach. If we knew what the chemicals were that were at fault or in excess or deficient, then we could devise a simple blood test. Now, can you imagine going to the doctor, like you might go for a cholesterol checkup for high blood pressure or whatever, and so you go for a simple blood test, which is relatively painless and not too much of a problem, and the doctor says to you, well, I'm afraid, Robert, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is you've got an elevated marker in your blood, and this tells me by this chart here that in the next, in your case, two years, you will have neurodegeneration. You'll have Alzheimer's in two years' time. That's the bad news. But the good news is now we have a medication, because we know the mechanism, to stop any more cells dying. Simple oral spray or, or the nasal <laughs> spray or oral medication. So take this medication right now, even though you have no symptoms. It will stop any more brain cells dying so the symptoms we never come on because we know the, sim the, the degeneration can start 20 years before symptoms sure. come on. So if you could couple the simple blood test with a way of stabilizing the cell loss, that for me would be the answer to everything because it would be relatively painless, relatively cheap, ethically not a problem whatsoever, non-invasive, and you could roll it out in our country, the National Health Service, in your country <laughs> now. <laughs> so right? you could actually... It would be something that would be practical and feasible right. and not kind of sensationalist or expensive. So the big problem is what we need in order to do that is we need to know what is this basic mechanism sure. of neurodegeneration. Sure. Now, this, I'd like to say, is my own theory, which is left of field. It's not the accepted wisdom. But frankly, the accepted wisdom has got us nowhere as yet. It hasn't led to a drug. What so is the accepted wisdom? The accepted wisdom is, well, the, the, the most popular theory is something called the amyloid hypothesis. Right, right. Amyloid are deposits in the brain coming from the Greek for starch because there are these lumps in the brain. And because these appear in post-mortem brains with Alzheimer's, it's long been believed that this is the cause of the neuronal death. The big problem I have is you can also see amyloid deposits in healthy brains. So if this was the cause, the primary cause, then uh, why, why would you see it in healthy brains? And moreover, how would you explain the selectivity, the fact that only certain cells are lost? Because amyloid is a bit like a molecular Rambo. Mm -hmm, it will mm -hmm. just punch holes in anything. <clears throat> so my own view is although this may feature in the downstream cascade of cause and effect, um, it is not the primary cause. So my own view, which is left afield, is something that nonetheless accounts for why only certain cells die, and also accounts for something else very interesting, which is that you frequently see a so-called copathology of Alzheimer's disease with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease is also a degenerative disorder, but one characterized by a problem with movement, whereas Alzheimer's disease is primarily one that's so-called cognitive, a confusion, disorientation, and memory mm -hmm. problems. So if we knew what these two 
um, diseases had in common, because they're both neurodegenerative, that might help us get to the, the nub of the problem. Mm. Now, what's very interesting is if you look in the brain at the primary area lost in Parkinson's, you'll find it's adjacent to the primary area lost in Alzheimer's. So you can imagine this kind of hub of cells in the brain where if one area is damaged, you'll have Parkinson's. If the other area is damaged, you'll have Alzheimer's. But if you have extensive damage, you'll have a copathology. Now, what's very exciting is this hub of cells in the brain, it turns out, come from a different part of the embryo. Mm. And if you come from a different part of the embryo, that means you may have very different features to your counterparts that came from another part of the embryo. So which are the brain centers that relate to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's? And, and what can we learn from the degeneration of those brain centers in terms of normal function? I think we can learn quite a lot because what's very interesting, and I think a great clue to us, one that hasn't really been picked up on too much, is that not all brain cells degenerate. So we know there's an area called the substantia nigra, mm -hmm. or so-called black mass, deep down in a hub of cells in the brain, adjacent to another area called the basal forebrain. Mm -hmm. And the basal forebrain is the one that is primarily associated when it dies, when the, when the cells uh, degenerate with Alzheimer's disease. And the two are, they're forming a kind of continuous mm -hmm. hub. Mm -hmm. Now, what we can learn from this about normal brain function is to look at the embryological provenance of these brain cells, because lo and behold, they come from a different part of the embryo to other cells mm. in the brain. And the fact they come from a different part of the embryo means very early on in life, they develop perhaps a different profile, different repertoire, different characteristics to the other cells in the brain. And I think that is the clue. And what we can learn from this is that these hub of cells in the brain, the ones that are vulnerable to neurodegeneration, and this I find very exciting. Among the various things they do that are different, they've retained their ability to grow. Hmm. They've retained their developmental mechanisms. Now, why is this lethal? Why should this mean that they are more vulnerable to um, the cycle <clears throat> of cell death? Well, what, as I'm sure you know, what people need to know is that um, when a cell grows, one of the triggers for growth is for calcium to enter in the cell. And this is fantastic. And so surely... If these cells are damaged, given they've retained their ability to grow for calcium to go in, isn't this a good thing? No, it's not, because calcium going into brain cells can be a good friend, but a deadly enemy. We know that in relatively low doses, it will cause growth and so on. But if you have too much going in, it overloads the cell so that the cell actually dies, becomes toxic. Mm. Now, of course, it can depend on how much time you're applying the agent that lets calcium in for, or the dose. But there's also another crucial factor, and that's age. We now know that very young cells can tolerate much more calcium, mobilize the calcium, use it in a way that mature cells do not. So this is what I think happens, is that if ordinary brain cells are damaged, as in a stroke, others will take over, and that's all just fine. And you get recovery of function, partial recovery of function. If this hub of cells are damaged in any way, uh -huh. in any way, they will respond by trying to grow again. Mm. They will mobilize this mechanism of development, which other cells don't have at their disposal, but they've still got it. Now, they don't know. They're not embryo cells anymore. <laughs> they're just boring old little brain cells. So now, because age will change the tolerance level to the calcium going in, now the same amount of calcium that would have been just fantastic to grow again mm -hmm. is going to kill you. Oh. So that's what it's I think. It's a maladaption. So it's a maladaption. So mm. what we learn about normal function is... Um, a, that you have very crudely different, very broad types of brain cells, some of which behave very differently from others, but also that context is all important. Context is everything in the brain. The context in which, the network in which, mm. the age in which things are happening can't be reduced to isolated, abstracted situations. It depends very much on how the thing works holistically. And my own view is that's what happens in neurodegeneration. We know in cases of dementia that the, the, the people, the elderly, begin to, hmm. as we say, e even commonly, begin to act like children. Yeah. Um, is, is there a deep neurophysiological reason why we make that analogy? Yeah, I, I think um, this actually relates to my own view of what the mind is. Um, when you think about it, dementia is a loss of mind. It's mm. an absence of mind. Mm. It's a parting of mm. mind. Mm. Um, 
we think of mind, or I think of mind, as the growth of the connections between brain cells that personalizes your brain as you're growing. Even if you're a clone, an identical twin, you're going to have a unique configuration of brain cell connections because they're driven and strengthened and shaped and updated right. by your ongoing dialogue right, with the world, right, your experiences. Right. So you can imagine, and you can actually see in, in certain pictures, brain cells growing these lovely branches. We call them dendrites, mm -hmm. technical word. Like after tree, Greek, after like the that. Greek for tree, yes, yeah. those are these branches. And you see these branches growing and growing, and that characterizes the growth of brain after birth. But then what can happen in dementia is that these branches are pruned back. Now, these branches enable you to make connections because you have a greater surface area. It follows, therefore, if these are pruned back, if these atrophy, if they're withering, those connections will no longer function. Mm, mm. So therefore, your brain will become slowly, slowly, progressively, more and more like that of a child, where when you think of a very small infant, a two or three year old infant, if someone came in dressed in a ghost costume, they might be very frightened by that because they wouldn't have the checks and balances. They wouldn't have the understanding, the prior experience for looking beyond the face value to understanding it mm -hmm. was just a silly grown up mm -hmm. dressed up as a ghost. Sadly, dementia patients are the same. That is to say they don't have any more the conceptual framework, the infrastructure, the checks and balances for understanding that something that might be novel or frightening is just a because they've lost all the connections lost, that the represented connections, yeah. those right. more sophisticated right. ways of so understanding. So slowly, slowly, uh, a dementing person will actually become more and more like a small child. And like a small child, they'll be confused and disorientated. They won't understand things. Their, under their misunderstanding, sadly, will increase. And gradually, things will mean less and less to them. And even people that were once very close to them that therefore would have triggered off lots and lots of connections, and these connections would have been obstinate and persisted till mm. later on. Mm. Sadly, even then, eventually, um, will go. And this is why, for the carers, in a sense, I think after a certain stage, it's more distressing than for the patient because the patient is almost like a small child again. Mm. As long as they have the sun on their face and they have nice taste in their mouth and they're warm and comfortable and nothing novel or frightening is happening, they would be content or have well-being. Mm -hmm. Whereas for the carer, Whilst a disease like um, cancer or heart disease will cause severe diseases, they're life-threatening diseases, you're still the person that you were. Whereas for carers with dementia patients, they will often go through the stages of bereavement, even though the person's still breathing, because they are experiencing the sense of loss that someone who's bereaved will, will feel. And society doesn't know this or doesn't recognise this as much as it should. So for someone who's a carer, um, they should really be regarded in many times, in many ways, as though they had lost a person, mm -hmm. as though they'd already lost a person. Um, you see those stages of bereavement.